one in the south with temperatures staying up into the mid to high teens. Some cloud around first thing across southern parts of England, perhaps even a few light showers. So that clears away and then Wednesday promises to be a largely sunny day across much of the UK. But for Scotland, Northern Ireland, a bit more cloud and a few showers mostly into the north of Scotland with a keen breeze here and it will feel cool in the north. Average temperatures for Northern England, Scotland, Northern Ireland, so high teens, low 20s. But in the south, still the potential for high 20s, the heat continues to affect southern parts of the UK and into Thursday and Friday that heat begins to build once again and that means that uh, there will be plenty of sunshine for many of us heading into the weekend but temperatures once again will become uncomfortable up into the 30s by Saturday. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, Matt. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9pm on GB News. Be there. And welcome to We Need to Talk About on GB News with me, Alex Phillips, where we get stuck into the big issues of the day that we need to look at in depth. Nothing is off the table and no one will be cancelled for saying what they think. Keeping me company today is writer and political commentator Benedict Spence. And here's what we're discussing on today's show. The race for number 10 is hotting up. There are now 10 runners and riders. Who's standing? What are they promising? And what happens next? Plus, Sir Mo Farah reveals he was trafficked into the UK using another child's name. Incredible stuff. But how common is this? And it's sweltering out there with an extreme weather warning for Sunday when it could reach a scorching 40 degrees. So it's time we were told to remember to drink stuff and stay alive. That's what we're talking about for the next hour. What do you need to talk about? If you can bear to move your sweaty paws, feel free to email us at gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet me at gbnews. First, though, it's time for the GB News headlines. Good afternoon. It's two minutes past two. I'm Rosie Wright, keeping you up to date on GB News. Conservative candidates have been presenting their pitches to replace Boris Johnson. Three have officially launched leadership campaigns today and therefore, if they become party leader, they will take over as prime minister. There are 10 candidates currently in the race after the Transport Secretary Grant Shapps stood down and gave his support to the former Chancellor Rishi Sunak. The Home Secretary, Priti Patel, has confirmed in the last 10 minutes that she will not be standing. 
Launching his campaign, the former Chancellor Rishi Sunak said, whilst it's not credible to promise more spending and lower taxes, he vows to lower the tax burden as soon as inflation has been brought under control. A message to the party and the country is simple. I have a plan to steer our economy through these headwinds. We need a return to traditional conservative economic values. And that means honesty and responsibility, not fairy tales. I am prepared to give everything I have in service to our nation, to restore trust, rebuild our economy and reunite the country. Head of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, Tom Tugendhat, promised to slash fuel duty by 10 pence if he was elected as Prime Minister. I'm sorry, but I cannot accept retreat. We should not accept retreat. We must return to service. We need leadership with a renewed sense of mission. Leadership that sees beyond divisive politics and delivers results. Leadership that will return government to the service of our economy, our people and our country. We need a clean start. Former Equalities Minister Kemi Badenoch opened her speech by saying it's time to tell the truth. Governing involves trade-offs and we need to start being honest about that. Unlike others, I'm not going to promise you things without a plan to deliver them. People are sick of that. They're crying out for honesty. Everyone running just has four hours left to get their nominations in today. Each needs at least 20 supporters for their name to be on the ballot. Voting then starts tomorrow. The country will have a new Prime Minister by the 5th of September. Meanwhile, the Labour Party has put forward a motion for no confidence in the Conservative government. The opposition have repeatedly said Boris Johnson should have left number 10 immediately after he resigned as Tory leader last week. If the vote goes ahead, expected to be tomorrow, all MPs can vote on whether the Conservatives stay in power. If the government loses, it could trigger a national election. In some other news now, Heathrow Airport is going to cap the number of daily passengers that pass through its doors as the airline industry struggles to deal with demand. Between July and September, now no more than 100,000 passengers will be able to depart from the airport in West London. The measures will mean more flights will be cut after thousands have already been cancelled in a bid to prevent more delays. The government has announced a £1 billion plan to rebuild 61 schools. In James Cleverley's first announcement as new education secretary, he said schools would receive state-of-the-art refurbishments. The investment will provide thousands of pupils with modern classrooms, as well as new sports halls, music rooms and science labs as part of the scheme. Japan has said goodbye to its former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who was assassinated last week. Amid a heavy police presence, close family and friends of Japan's longest-serving premier have attended a private funeral service in Tokyo. Abe was shot when he was making a speech at a campaign event last week. After the ceremony, the hearse bearing Abe's body was carried in a procession throughout the streets of Tokyo. Downing Street says significant work is being done to protect the most vulnerable during the heat wave. The spokesperson said planning is underway within the NHS, local councils and transport networks. It's after the Met Office issued an amber alert for extreme heat for Sunday, covering most of England and parts of Wales, warning of possible dangers to life from heat. This is GB News. I'll bring you more as it happens. Now let's head back to Alex for We Need to Talk About. So they ousted a Prime Minister who got them the biggest election win in decades and are now scrapping like toddlers in a sand pit rather than running the country during a crisis. No wonder the Tories have toppled in the polls. And worse than that, they're playing with their own rules to stitch up the final two contenders in the leadership race. Not that we get to choose anyway, but at least headlines and opinion polls might have had some kind of effect. A muffled murmur from Mr and Mrs Miggins. Meanwhile, out came a slew of ugly smears and dirty briefings. Who would want that lot running the country? Even Tory members don't seem to like their government much, with the grassroots backing underdogs who haven't been in Cabinet. You know, 
Those people who took jobs from Boris while sneakily making cheesy videos for their own leadership campaigns. And what really smacks of hypocrisy is the sudden use of the exact woke identity politics they're all vowing to destroy. I'm an immigrant. I'm a woman. I'm the exhumed corpse of Margaret Thatcher. Meanwhile, the chainsaw approach to the economy hardly fills you with confidence that the Treasury is about to be managed by anybody who can even add up. What I want, more than anything, is a decent human being to look after our United Kingdom. Is that too much to ask? Well, 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 three people have launched their campaigns today, so let's get the latest with our political correspondent, Tom Harwood. Tom, give us a synopsis of what they've all been saying. Yes, it's been a busy day on the campaign trail, although nominations aren't closing until later today. We'll find out who the official candidates are at around 6 p.m. That's when the 1922 committee is expected to wrap up that nomination process. And let's remember, these MPs need 20 nominations, 20 MP backers to get them onto the list. And that's already seen some dramatic moments. Rishi Sunak launched his campaign at 11 a.m. today. And just before Rishi Sunak himself walked out to the stage, a bit of a surprise. Grant Shapps walked into the room. And for those who've been paying close attention to the race, they'll know that Grant Shapps was standing himself to become leader. Well, that was the first indication we had that Grant Shapps had pulled out of the race in order to endorse Rishi Sunak. Uh, Dominic Raab also introducing him, the, uh, the deputy prime minister there. So lots of establishment support for Rishi Sunak, but also some challenger launches this morning morning. Tom Tugendhat and Kemi Badenoch, both uh, standing on a, a position from people who haven't been in the cabinet. Tom Tugendhat, chair of the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee. Kemi Badenoch, someone who's been a, a minister in a number de of departments, but never in the cabinet. So these are more insurgent campaigns. And who knows whether they'll actually get over the line of those 20 nominations. One of the interesting points about Grant Shapps dropping out this morning of the race is he had a number of backers. And those backers haven't all followed him to Rishi Sunak. Indeed, Paul Bristow, one of those uh, initial Grant Shapps backers, the MP for Peterborough, has now backed Liz Truss. Liz Truss, also this morning at around midday, uh, found support from Jacob Rees-Mogg and Nadine Dorries. They announced that after today's Cabinet meeting. So that's just some of the drama that has taken place in the last few hours. But there's more to come. The first hustings event of Conservative MPs starts this afternoon. It's hosted by the Common Sense Group of Conservative MPs and will be focusing on cultural issues. Each of the candidates will have a, a, a section of time to put their case to MPs through those organised hustings within the House of Commons. And of course, 6pm, that vital, that vital time, that's when this nomination process uh, concludes. No doubt some more candidates dropping out. One final thing, of course, we've had someone else who hadn't actually declared they were a candidate dropping out already, and that is Priti Patel. She had 13 people saying that if she were to stand, they'd back her. But as of the last few minutes, Priti Patel has now herself said she will not, in the end, stand to be Tory leader. So where those 13 potential backers will go is anyone's guess. Uh, looking at the state of play right now, it's still a fairly broad field with nine candidates. Tom, thank you ever so much. Exciting times indeed. Do you know what? I feel like we should get you a flat cap and one of those lit microphones so you look like a racing commentator while you keep us updated with the runners and riders. Tom Harwood, our GB News political correspondent. Well, Michael Fabricant is the Conservative MP for Litchfield in Staffordshire and joins me now. Michael, you, of course, were perhaps one of the biggest champions of uh, soon-to-be ex-Prime Minister Boris Johnson. So who are you backing to fill those boots? Well, I'm backing Penny Morden. And by the way, I was very impressed with what Tom Harwood had to say. 
as ever, he had uh, most of the politics there on the nail. Uh, the main hustings, which he didn't mention, is going to be t on Wednesday. So on Wednesday, the big, big date tomorrow, at 5 o'clock, there's going to be the announcement of the results, because we'll be voting tomorrow between 1.30 and 2.30. And the interesting thing is that although you've got 10 runners and riders, I don't think that all 10 are actually going to meet the criteria as to have 20 people nominating them. So there'll be a lot of people dropping out, just like Grant Shapps did and moving across to Rishi Sunak and others. Uh, so then we'll have the, as I say, 1.30 to 2.30 tomorrow, the first ballot. Then 5 o'clock, we have the announcement of the results, and that's immediately followed by hustings. Uh, for all the candidates who are remaining, and that's for all the parliamentary party, not just the small group uh, that uh, Tom spoke about just now. And who am I backing? I'm backing Betty Morden. Michael, you could give me a run for the money, run for my money doing my job. That was a brilliant analysis there. Um, I mean, you. what's interesting, I think, about this contest is people who haven't served in cabinet, backbenchers, people who weren't necessarily household names, are actually doing really well, especially when you look at polling of grassroots. Does that excite you that we might be able to have a completely refreshed cabinet, or does that fill you with fear? Well, what fills me with fear is that. You're absolutely right in that Rishi Sunak has got by far the biggest number of MPs supporting him. But all the polls that have been done amongst Conservative Party members, round about 200,000, just under, don't actually have Rishi Sunak as big or that popular. Uh, rightly or wrongly, people assume that he's the guy who's responsible for certain things that have happened already, and they want to change. And the most popular person does seem to be Penny. So for once, I seem to be on the side of a possible winner, providing Penny is in the final two. And what worries me is that there might be some dirty shenanigans amongst the leadership contenders to keep Penny out. And that's the sort of thing that goes on in Parliament, I'm afraid. Talking about dirty shenanigans and skullduggery, what do you make of the 1922 committee changing the rules fairly late on in the game and really accelerating the pace of this contest? It feels to me that even though the general public don't get a vote on this, we're not getting much time to really look in the whites of the eyes of the people who are vying to be the next prime minister. Yeah, I'm afraid I think it was a necessity, though. I don't think they had much choice in the matter because Parliament rises for the long summer recess at the end of next week. In practice, most people will be gone by Wednesday evening of next week. Uh, so we had to make a decision before then. And if we'd stuck to the old rules, and I love, by the way, this picture of me. Can you see I'm on the right? You can see the back of my head. I'm the one with the blonde hair nodding and pounding the table. Funnily enough, the clip that you're showing is the clip when they announced that Boris Johnson had won the vote of no confidence. So uh, in a way, it's all the broadcasters have been showing that particular clip. And it does slightly amuse me, given now what has happened. Do you know, looking at that clip, you would go down really well in my uh, local pub quiz. And indeed, you'd be a valued team member with your excellent insights as well. Who other oh, than the you. blonde Michael Fabricant? Thank you ever so much for joining me on today's show. Well, let's talk now to Chris Curtis, who is head of political polling at Opinion Research. Now, Chris, of course, this isn't a presidential race, although it kind of feels like it. The public don't get to vote, but Obviously, you'd imagine that MPs are thinking ahead to the next election and wanting their party to win as many seats as possible to protect their jobs. So where do the opinion polls lie when it comes to the runners and riders? I mean, unfortunately, that's a really tricky question to answer because not all candidates um, have, have, have got sort of equal levels of awareness among the public. Some people are pretty well heard of, like Rishi Sunak. Some people, uh, most people won't have heard of, like Tom Tugendhat, for example, or, or, or Penny Morden. Uh, so it is sort of really tricky to do a side-by-side -side comparison. We do know that Rishi Sunak's numbers are starting to bounce back from the unpopularity um, that we were seeing for him a few months ago, but beyond that, it's very, very tricky to make to make <clears throat> to make particular 
um, comparisons. Um, I think quite often it's, it's, it's possibly better to work backwards. It's worth thinking about what exactly it is voters want and are looking for right now, and then to sort of pick the candidate um, who ends up who ends up sort of best best achieving that aim. And I think there's two things that the Conservative Party need to make sure they do in this leadership contest. Firstly, select someone who's going to unite the Conservative Party. Divided parties don't win elections, um, and, and they need to be able to sort of hold that very difficult coalition of MPs in Parliament together. And the second thing I think voters are looking for is a little bit of calm. I think there is a sense growing that the Conservative Party um, has had so many scandals associated with it over the past few months that it hasn't been able to focus on voters' priorities, fixing the NHS, growing the economy, making sure that there's enough jobs for people, uh, supporting people in the cost of living crisis. Those big issues that are actually affecting people's lives just aren't really getting talked about and aren't really getting the airtime in government that many people think they deserve. So I think voters want somebody who's going to bring a little bit more calm to politics and focus specifically on those priorities um, that they have and that are actually affecting their lives. I mean, we have grown very used to seeing internecine warfare in the Conservative Party, huge splits and schisms when it comes to Brexit, for instance. And now there seems to be a bit of a tug of war between what's perceived as the left of the party and what's perceived as the right of the party. And yet everyone seems to invoke Margaret Thatcher. How do you read that situation? Is there still this big divide between sort of centrist Conservatives, Cameroons and then Johnsonian type MPs? Well, I think it's tricky because um, there's sort of there, there, there's there's multiple dimensions to this. I think there's obviously the Brexit dimension. You have some people who are, you know, very pro Brexit, want the hardest Brexit possible. Uh, you want some people who ideally would take us back into the European Union, even within the Conservative Parliamentary Party. You have some people who are very right wing on economics, shrink the size of the state, make sure we cut taxes down to as low as they can get, and some people. Um, who actually think that it's really important that a Conservative government correctly funds public services. Oh, yeah, uh, increases support for public services right now. You have this sort of social dimension. You have Conservative MPs who are very much wanting to fight that culture war and, you know, bring down immigration, um, issues like that. And other Conservative MPs who are a lot more liberal um, on many of those issues. And we're seeing, like people from all of the different dimensions. So you might have sort of socially conservative, but economically left wing, socially liberal, but economically right wing, all of these different dimensions playing out in this conservative leadership contest. Ultimately, the person that's going to win it is the person who can um, build the, the, the widest coalition um, who reaches across that within the conservative membership. Well, they should all be wishing they were tuning into you to get your magic recipe. Chris Curtis, Head of Political Polling at Opinion Research, always great to have you on the programme. Well, joining me for the next hour is the writer and political commentator, Benedict Spence. Now, Benedict, three campaigns have launched today. Mm. I can't keep up with it. Rishi Sunak, Kemi Badenoch and Tom Tugendhat. So let's start with Rishi. It seems to me he is really pushing for truth on the economy, mm. calling out his opponents for a race to cut taxes and saying, I'm going to tell you honestly, we can't do that right now. Yeah. But economical with other policies. I think a policy of honesty on the economy is, is the best way forward for Rishi Sunak because otherwise he's going to be tarred with the brush of being part of Boris Johnson's government. And of course, dishonesty is perhaps the big thing that did for Boris Johnson. Um, I did think it's very interesting, though, that he is so popular uh, at the moment amongst fellow Tory MPs for whom, you know, the great accusation against them has been a real lack of inspiration uh, going forward. They seem to be very keen on him because he's the safest candidate and therefore the most likely uh, to keep their seats, albeit perhaps with a reduced majority come the next general election. But you compare him to other candidates with the broader uh, Tory membership and, of course, he's not so popular. And I think that that shows that there is a real desire for something a little bit different going forward and the idea that actually that safety first is not really what a lot of members want. Of course, he might posit that by saying, well, what a lot of members want is fantasy and, you know, not very helpful. But I do think that that's very curious, that as much as Rishi Sunak has tried to paint himself as a safe pair of hands and he is trying to slightly distance himself from his time as Boris's chancellor, it's not necessarily cutting through with the membership. Fascinating stuff, Benedict. Thank you ever so much. I want to know your views. Does anyone take your fancy? Who's caught your eye? Same old establishment politicians. Or do you want one of the newbies? GBviews at gbnews.uk or tweet us at gbnews. You're with GB News on TV and radio. Coming up, Sir Mo Farah has revealed he was trafficked to the UK as a child and made to work as a servant. 
Just how common is his story? Time for a short break now. Let me check on the weather forecast. Hello again, I'm Aidan McGiven from the Met Office. Very warm once again this afternoon in the south, but it has turned a bit cooler further north, although most places are fine. It's a decent sunny day for the vast majority. It is cloudier, however, compared to the last couple of days, a courtesy of a cold front which has moved in. It's brought some rain to the northwest earlier on, but it's weakening all the while. And really, as we head into the evening, just a few spots of rain affecting parts of Wales and the Midlands, and then most places dry overnight. One or two showers into the north of Scotland, a brisk breeze here, the cloud further south tending to break up, so some clear spells by dawn. But it's a warm night in the south, 17 to 19 Celsius, cooler further north, 11 to 13 degrees for Scotland, Northern Ireland and Northern England. Into the start of Wednesday then, warm across much of England and Wales from the word go, plenty of sunshine, any cloud in the far south tending to break and disappear. And then blue skies for much of the day for England and Wales, a bit more cloud for Northern Ireland and Scotland, a few showers for central Scotland, northern Scotland as well. 18 Celsius for Glasgow, 20 for Belfast, but up into the mid to high 20s once again for South Wales and Southern England. And that sunshine again will feel hot. So we keep the heat in the south, even if it does turn cooler for a few days further north. But for the vast majority, it is staying dry. And into Wednesday night, it's another relatively warm night with temperatures in the south only dipping to 15 to 17 Celsius, 11 to 13 for Scotland, Northern Ireland and Northern England. A few showers around for Northern Ireland and Northern and Western Scotland first thing Thursday. Bright skies otherwise and plenty of sunshine for the southern half of the UK once again. And by this stage, well, things are starting to turn warmer. And by the weekend, widespread sunny skies return and we're back up into the 30s. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, Matt. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9pm on GB News. Be there. What a story. Wait a mo, Sir Mo. 20th century Fox are on the blower, already scripting your biopic. The breathtaking revelation that Sir Mo Farah, long distance runner extraordinaire and national treasure, was actually trafficked into the country as a slave and isn't even called Mohammed Farah is the stuff of Hollywood fantasy. You know me as Mo Farah, but it's not my name or it's not the reality. The real story is I was born in Somaliland, north of Somalia. 
as Hussein Abdi Kahin. It really is amazing stuff. But for all the noise that movements like BLM make, as people agitate over granite busts and marble statues of long-dead people from a different era, actual human trafficking and modern-day slavery is out of control. From 2,340 known victims in 2014 to 10,000 in 2020, the real number is probably more than 100,000. They're coming over in boats across the channel. They're working in nail bars on high streets. They're hand-washing cars. They're being cruelly plucked from the borders of Ukraine as we speak. But we're all too busy debating censoring history. Enough. This should not be happening in 2022. Let's hope Mo's story shakes us all out of a stupor when it comes to this cruel trade in human beings because it's under your very nose, if you choose to see it. Joining me now on the show is Phil Brewer, who's the specialist advisor on modern slavery at the Human Trafficking Foundation. Phil, it is a breathtaking, extraordinary story um, about Mo Farah, but how often is this happening in the UK? Tell us a bit more about the bigger picture. Yeah, Alex, this is, uh, you know, as you open with, this is... Um almost like a, a Hollywood script, but the reality is this is, this is reality for, for many people. You know, if you look at the official government statistics from last year, um, over 12,000 people were referred into the government process that assesses cases and recognises people as, uh, as victims of modern slavery. And, and you know, be, behind that is, is, is greed. Um, there's no other way of putting this. Um, it's it's people that look at saving uh, of, of cutting costs in terms of businesses, um, saving money on domestic help, um, actually you know using people as commodities uh, in sort of criminal exploitation as well. Give us a, a, a bit more insight into the sort of people being trafficked. What sort of countries are they coming from? How are they getting here? Where are they working? What are they being forced to do? So I, it, it can impact on anyone. And, uh, and what I'd say is last year, the highest number of people exploited that referred into that process was actually UK citizens. So this isn't just about foreign nationals coming to the UK to be exploited. It happens with people that are born here, are raised here, who live within our own communities, who we'd probably even recognise. Uh, and the fact is, is that Behind that will be some sort of vulnerability that exploit exploiters play on, uh, and you know they, they are wide and varied. It, it could be sort of you know financial um, uh, sort of issues. It could be drug dependency. Um, it, it could be you know in the sake of, of, of children that actually um, loved ones, their parents, uh, guardians um, aren't there to support them in the way that they that they want to or that they should be being supported. So it is wide and varied, and I, I could probably take up your whole programme talking about it, but it's those vulnerabilities that that, is, that people focus on, uh, the exploiters, uh, and what, why they target certain individuals. Uh, and very brief, briefly, Phil, we don't have much time left. How can we spot these people? And if we think we've identified someone in those circumstances, what should we do? Look, this is, this is sort of going against human nature in some respects, but if you feel something isn't right, if you see that person only ever outside the front of the house sweeping up, never going out enjoying themselves, just have that confidence to either contact the police or the Modern Slavery and Exploitation Helpline, uh, and you can, you can report that, or even Crime Stoppers. There are different ways of doing that, and you don't have to give your name, but just have confidence in reporting it. Yeah, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't harm, does it, uh, reporting these things. Phil Brewer, who is from the Human Trafficking Foundation, thank you so much for shining some light on this massively important story. Well, let's talk to Benedict about this. I mean, it, we bang on all the time about slavery 500 years ago, and it's actually on the up here, as far as I can tell, and it's horrifying. Uh, the, the problem is, slavery has been a factor of the human condition almost since humans started forming societies, is that people have been you know, made, basically, to serve others. Um, and when it is that you decide exclusively to view slavery through the prism of one era, say the transatlantic slave trade, even though that was you know, done on an industrial scale, 
you 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 negate what came before and you negate what came afterwards, and then you set yourself up internally through the prism of uh, one set of people saying that this um, this form of slavery was exclusively bad, and everybody else saying, well, we're opposed to that form of slavery, ergo we're good, and that's the problem. I think as much as anything else, it's a problem when people point out that Britain was the first developed nation to you know, abolish the slave trade and to oppose it. Because that way you're setting yourself up and saying, well, Britain is a fundamentally good country and we don't have slavery here, we got rid of it. Well, as has just been pointed out there, it still exists very much in this country and it's people who were born in this country. It's not just people who are trafficked from overseas. And that, I think, when, when we look at it exclusively through the prism of transatlantic, uh, the transatlantic slave trade, we do ourselves a disservice and we don't get any closer to addressing the real problem. Yeah, and a big problem and needs to be addressed. Benedict, thank you ever so much. You're with GB News on TV and DAB Radio. Coming up, the temperatures are soaring with an extreme heat warning issued for this Sunday. I'll get an expert view on why it's getting so hot. Now, though, it's time for a check on the news headlines. Good afternoon. It's 2.33. I'm Rosie Wright, keeping you up to date. Tory leadership candidates have been presenting their pitches to replace Boris Johnson and take over as Prime Minister. There are 10 candidates currently in the race after Transport Secretary Grant Shapp stood down and gave his support to the former Chancellor Rishi Sunak. The Home Secretary, Priti Patel, has also confirmed she will not be standing. Well, those running need to get their nominations in by today's 6pm deadline. Each needs at least 20 supporters to go through to the first ballot. Voting starts tomorrow. The country will have a new Prime Minister in place by the 5th of September. Meanwhile, the Labour Party has put forward a motion to hold a confidence vote in the government. The official opposition says Boris Johnson should have left number 10 immediately after he resigned as Tory leader last week. If the ballot goes ahead, expected to be tomorrow, all MPs can vote on whether the Conservatives stay in power. If the government loses, it could trigger a national election. In other news now, and Heathrow Airport has introduced a cap on the number of daily passengers that can pass through its terminals. The measure has been introduced as the airline industry struggles to deal with demand. Between July and September, no more than 100,000 passengers will be able to depart from the airport in West London. Japan has said goodbye to its former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who was assassinated last week. Amid a heavy police presence, close family and friends of Japan's longest-serving premier attended a private funeral service in Tokyo. He was shot whilst making a speech in a campaign event last week. After the ceremony, a hearse carrying the body was accompanied by police on a procession throughout the city. TV online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Shortly, we'll be back to Alex for We Need to Talk About. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News.
Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, mate. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7 p.m. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9 p.m. on GB News. Be there. While all eyes are on the race as who will be the next prime minister, hundreds of migrants are using the hot weather and calm waters to cross the channel in boats. Meanwhile, not a single flight has left for Rwanda, also raising the question of whether the next prime minister will ditch the plan. And you remember we reported on that massive bust of a trafficking ring a week ago. Well, despite one criminal faction being removed from operation, it's clear plenty more are at large, somehow evading the intelligence and police forces of multiple countries to still smuggle people from as far away as East Africa to the coast of Britain on a daily basis. Well, GB News Home and Security Editor Mark White is in the studio to talk about this now. Mark, what are the latest figures and, and, and what's happened in the wake of that big bust last week? Well, we were told by authorities that that very sizable operation, an international operation that saw 39 people arrested in France, in Germany, in the Netherlands and here in the UK would have a short-term impact on the number of small boats coming across simply because the network that they were going after was a network that, according to uh, the authorities here, the National Crime Agency and their international partners, was responsible for the smuggling of some 10,000 people in recent months across the channel. And this particular network was supplying, it's alleged, the small boats, buying them in Turkey, specially made, shipping them to Germany, where they were being stored at various locations there, before being shipped to northwestern France and assembled, and then, of course, put across the channel. However, in the six days since that very significant operation, we have had now more than 1,000 people who have been pulled from small boats in the channel. Just yesterday, 442 people were pulled off 15 small boats in the English Channel. And again today, there are multiple incidents out in the English Channel that are being reported to authorities at Border Force and lifeboats are currently attending. So far, more than 100 people have been brought ashore, but it will be much higher than that by the end of the day. Uh, so clearly, uh, they are getting their hands on small boats uh, from other suppliers. We are told by our producer in Kent, who's been speaking to his sources on the French side of the channel, uh, that the people smugglers have been hiding uh, these boats and other equipment in the countryside around some of the locations, the beaches where they regularly set off from uh, to get into the English Channel to make that crossing. So for the time being, at least, they seem to still have, uh, well, it's very self-evident, they still have the small boats to get them across the Channel. Mark, thank you so much. Mark White, our home and security editor there. Benedict, I mean, this is just an ongoing saga. And I often think that we don't actually know a lot about who these gangs are, who mm. these people are, and really what's going on under the surface. I mean, it does appear to be the case that they're very difficult, to, for, certainly for us to stamp out if they're operating in mainland Europe. But I think the main problem is, as much as anything else, that we can do what we can to try to intercept boats, try to pick people up. If they're being launched from another country's territory and they're being launched en masse and, you know, if, if they're able to store uh, these dinghies, you know, for quite so long and transport them across uh, the continent without them being stopped, it's clearly not much of a priority for the European Union to, to do anything about it as well. But, and why would it be? Because ultimately these are people who are not coming to stay in Europe. These are people who just want to travel across. And I think that that is, you know, is a large part of the problem, it ultimately, is that there is perhaps not quite as much pushback in Europe itself as perhaps there should be. Yeah, that is a point that's very rarely made, but a very important one to make. Thank you, Benedict. Well, 
I've just come back from Sardinia, which was pretty much like being in a nuclear fission reactor. And apart from my skin peeling like a sloughing snake, I am miraculously alive. In fact, I chose to go to a country that feels like it's 200 meters from the sun, like many of us being herded through airports like cattle, while our suitcases are stacked in a giant game of luggage Jenga. But as soon as we get a heat wave here, the reaction is as though apocalypse is nigh. And of course, the best way to not spontaneously combust in your Arctic air-conditioned office is to not bother going in at all. That's the all too predictable call from unions, who now demand everyone work from home and spin like rotisserie chickens in the garden instead. So while you try not to microwave your dog in the car and remember to, you know, drink, just enjoy it, folks, because it won't be long before we're all moaning about the great British drizzle again. Joining me now is GB News South East of England reporter Ellie Costello. Ellie, what's it like out there? Is it Scorcheroo? Yes, good afternoon, Alex. I can safely say this is the first time I've worn a sundress to report at work, and it doesn't even look that hot. Cameraman Joe has been saying to me, I'm going to tell you it's 31 degrees here. It doesn't even look like it because it's so overcast and cloudy here in London. But Alex, the mercury has hit 31 degrees here on Hampstead Heath. You can see uh, the scorched grass around me, and if you're listening on radio, it has already uh, turned this yellowy hue. And just behind me is... Um, Hampstead Heath ponds down there. There are people, despite the signs saying you're not supposed to swim, uh, there are many people swimming up and down uh, the lakes behind me and others are just sitting on the edges and dipping their toes in. Uh, many people saying, quite frankly, it's just too hot. And as you were saying, Alex, that they're, they're saying uh, this country can't quite cope with it. So I was speaking to people on Hampstead Heath this afternoon. This is what they've told me. Well, for me, it isn't that hot. I'm uh, from Romania, so we're used to even hotter temperatures. So, uh, yeah, we're enjoying it. It's way too hot. I'm, I'm not doing well. You're not doing well. <laughs> I've got a water bottle on me all the time, and it's like... I mean, we say this, but you're out and about, you're going for a walk, you're doing very well. Well, I thought because it was going to be a bit more overcast, it would be OK, but, um, yeah, no. Yeah, I'm loving the weather at the moment. It's great. I love the sunshine, but I burn quite easily, so I've got to make sure I lather up. I actually love it. I mean, work outdoors all the time, so it's like, you know, working in the winter, suddenly you've got this beautiful weather. It's fantastic. Love it. Well, Alex, you're just back from Sardinia, but in London today and in many parts of the United Kingdom where it is 31 degrees, it's actually hotter than Barcelona, Milan, even Cancun in Mexico. And lots of people, as you just heard there, are really enjoying the sunshine. But there is a serious side to all of this as well. And government officials met at an emergency COBRA meeting yesterday uh, looking at the possibility of a national emergency with this heat wave if these temperatures continue uh, for the next week week, which they are indeed forecast to do. Uh, now, a national emergency is declared when hot weather is so extreme that it could cause illness and death in fit and healthy people. And now there is an amber weather warning for Sunday of this week where temperatures could reach 40 degrees. Now, if that happens, that will be the hottest day in the UK on record, the hottest day ever. Ever. And of course, there would be uh, great concern for the elderly and the vulnerable as well who may suffer in this heat. So the advice is to stay hydrated, to stay inside, especially in the hot midday sun. And if you do have elderly neighbours, perhaps check in on them and see if they need anything from the shops uh, to save them a journey uh, outside. Of course, unions suggesting that people work from home. Uh, Network Rail has warned of speed restrictions in part of the country. They're worried about the tracks and the overheating as well and the RAC have said that if you're starting car journeys start them early on in the day and get those finished uh, before the heat really hits those roads but for those of you who are struggling with the heat and are watching at home this could go on for an awfully long time that amber weather warning looking to last into the start of next week. Ellie Costello there reporting from Hampstead Heath. Well, joining me now is senior meteorologist at British Weather Services, Jim Dale. Jim, Ellie, they're saying, well, this could go on for an awfully long time. I'd say it could go on for a wonderfully long time. Tell us more. Can we expect more sunshine for weeks, months, or is it going to be a flash in the pan? 
Hi, Alex. Um, it's going to be a little bit of a flash in the pan. Um, look, this, this, I'm, I'm going to bring you right up to date with where we are at this moment in time. Um, I know everybody's saying Sunday's going to be the big day. <clears throat> it may well be the start of the big day, uh, but actually I think Monday and Tuesday, the following two days, are actually going to be warmer. Uh, we've done some sums here, and we reckon the, the challenge to the British record is more likely to be. I think it's probably going to be the Monday. We'll wait and see on the Tuesday. It's, an, it's another week away. So that means you get three days where you're going to see somewhere in the UK, probably the southeast and east, uh, 35 degree plus, and possibly possibly knocking on the door that, of that record. Whether we touch 40 is another is a questionable thing. I'll tell you where will, and that's France, um, many parts of France and Spain, and some of the low countries next door to us. Yeah, I think it's entirely possible. So this is not just the unique uh, British affair. This is this is very much shared with uh, a few other people. Yeah, now I jest, don't I, about, uh, you know, the fact that us Brits seem to regard it apocalyptic when we get a bit of sunshine. But at temperatures, uh, you know, reaching up to 40 degrees, we really aren't prepared for that. We don't have the infrastructure to manage those kinds of things, do we? No, we're, we're a temperate country. We, we, are, we have been since uh, since the dawn of man, but, but uh, virtually. So we're, we're used to, um, uh, let's just say, something more comfortable. And the, the, these sort of things, now... Like, I will mention the C word, uh, the climate change world, because this is probably a taste of the future, if that makes sense. I know we get tastes occasionally in the past, little spikes that come up um, that, that pushes in that direction. But I think if you if you look at the data, it's very clear that the last decade, in particularly, uh, that, that sh that's without question a, a one-way ticket, uh, not quite to the moon, but not far off it, going in the upwards direction. So. You know, I think we have to be prepared for this. You, you're quite right. We're right behind the the, the, the rails when it comes to uh, preparation for this. And I, I do notice, actually, I, even within the, the Tory um, leadership bids, etc. I mean, we hear a lot about taxes. We hear a bit about fox hunting. We don't hear anything about climate change. There we had one or two of the people yesterday, one or two of the candidates sweating their heads off and nothing. And I'm thinking, come on, this is your time. This is your time to strike. Anyway, by the way, we, we, this has got to come on the agenda because it isn't just about fantasy land going out there getting sunburned. Some people do like this. Um, there, there are serious, serious problems when you get these sort of temperatures. Yeah, tell you what, Jim, it's all about how people are going to pay for their heat in this winter rather than how hot it's actually getting. Jim Dale, thank you ever so much for coming on the programme. Benedict. What are your thoughts? Do you know what? I, I heard that, that, we, that some places are using gritters to actually stop tarmac from melting. That's very ingenious. Yeah, so that's quite, quite, a, quite a good use of those things. You You're getting double the... Creature? Yeah, yeah, I am. <laughs> I like to go to Greece or Italy, wherever it is, at least once every summer. Um, I, look, I mean, civilizations have managed to survive in very hot uh, places for a very long time. You know, I think even now, as much as we're all sitting here going, it's dreadful, <laughs> everybody in the Indian subcontinent is probably looking at us and going, oh, that's a little bit, a little bit chilly, relatively, <laughs> all, things, all things considered. Um, it requires proactivity. You know, the, the idea of climate change, climate is in a constant state of flux. It has never been this solid, permanent thing. It was always going to go up at some point and it will go back down again at some other point. It does require governments to be proactive. It requires building companies, it requires railway companies to think about these things a bit in advance. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. You know, humans do tend to react when their surroundings change, when their environment changes. We're pretty good at it. It's how we've risen to the top of, of the hierarchy on this planet. So it doesn't fill me with a great sort of deal of trepidation. I think if people need to be reminded that they need to stay in the shade when it's really hot and to drink water, Maybe you know. Maybe that's a, that's more of a you problem than a than a climate problem. But, you know, it's funny. I was going to ask you that next. It does seem to me like really puerile advice. But we all go do lally because we don't get this very often. I mean, there are. I mean, it's true, and there are some things that people do need to be reminded of. I mean, every year there are cases of people leaving their dogs in cars and stuff when it gets hot, and you just think, what on earth is going through your mind? So I, you do understand why some reminders do have to be put out. But I don't really see it as this thing for everybody to lose their minds about. Yeah, as I say, at some point in the future, we were going to have to address the fact that climate does change. If it takes a couple of Indian summers for us to think, ah, oh, well, we might need to think about building rail tracks that don't melt every summer, I don't see what the problem is about that. That seems to me to be an inherently good thing. Yeah, if only we had an inherently sensible government year after year. <laughs> Thank you ever so much. Well, on that subject, no, I'm not the latest child of an immigrant to, to declare my intention to be your next Prime Minister. I'm just super bonzed having got back from Hollybobs, a dream vacay of sunbathing. 
while laughing watching politicians make campaign videos you could mistake for spoofs. And the Jonathan Pye Award for the most excruciating has to go to Penny Mordaunt. Oh, forget the fact it included infamous killer Oscar Pistorius. No, it was the backing track of I vow to thee my country, while a plummy aircraft safety announcer from 1962 explained over pound shop stock photos that Britain was electing a new leader. It's what I can assume was only imagined to be an audience of mentally challenged beings from outer space. Stay tuned for the Alex agenda, but after that, watch it. Just remember to have your inhaler at the ready for when you hyperventilate in hysterics. Well, the world is soon to be blessed with the Archangels Montecito making a speech at the UN for Nelson Mandela Day. It's fitting that the Sussexes should take centre stage under the motto, do what you can with what you have where you are. Who can forget Harry's struggle having been thrown out of his country and cut off from daddy's money to languish in a $22.5 million California mansion with only 13 bathrooms in which to mop his tears. And Meghan's inspirational interview when they were last in South Africa, dancing with poverty-stricken kids in the townships as she blinked back tears and told Tom Bradby that not many people have asked if she was OK. The two will be an inspiration during the cost of living crisis, especially with Harry's tell-all book being delayed until next year, so he doesn't get too exhausted with a punishing one-day-a-month schedule and no doubt so he can include a chapter about how he hurts over the loss of his grandma. We're blessed to have such messianic humans show the world what struggle is all about. Now, just as the UK takes the lead in standing up against the warmongering, globally destabilizing criminal cruelty of Putin, our publicly funded broadcasting corporation has decided to make a program throwing about fake news that endangers the reputation and the lives of British soldiers. The BBC's Panorama episode alleges the SAS ran death squads and has been slammed by the actual Ministry of Defence for unjustified conclusions from allegations that had been fully investigated. And the MOD didn't hold back, adding that the programme is irresponsible and puts the armed forces at risk, saying they strongly object to such subjective reporting. Who needs Russian state TV when you can pay £159 a year for the BBC? And take a look at this. This is the world's first full-colour picture from the new James Webb Space Telescope, the deepest, most detailed images of the universe to date. Light from galaxies that has taken billions of years to reach planet Earth. Oh, US President Joe Biden was shown the image during a White House briefing and was so emotional as he recognised his very own birth at the dawn of time. Benedict, that was my little <laughs> scoop from the recent headlines I picked up from the beach. Thoughts? Right at the end there, you couldn't resist. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, I'm going to sound like such a nerd, but it's the space, tele you know, the, the, the photograph of the telescope. When you zoom out and you see actually how small a chunk of the night sky it is. It's absolutely minuscule, and you compare it to, you know, what you can see around it. Um, and it does just make everything that's going on, certainly with the Tory leadership race and the slight raise in temperature over here, it really does make it seem so very insignificant when you try to get your head around the, the scale that's involved and everything else that is out there. And here we are talking about the fact that things are very hot and people are woke and they have the wrong pronouns. And it just does kind of make you think, there is a lot more that could come from our country, from our society. There's a lot more that we could be focusing on. Other societies are building telescopes like that and they're going to be adventuring off into space and, you know, soon there are plans for bases on Mars. What are we doing with the, with the resources we have? Not enough. How very philosophical and beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much, Benedict. What are we doing indeed? We're finishing the programme. We Need to Talk About is back on GB News, same time, 2 o'clock tomorrow. Coming up next, it's Darren McCaffrey. But first... It's time for the weather forecast. Enjoy the sunshine. Bye-bye. Hello again, I'm Aidan McGiven from the Met Office. Very warm once again this afternoon in the south, but it has turned a bit cooler further north, although most places are fine. It's a decent sunny day for the vast majority. 
It is cloudier, however, compared to the last couple of days, a courtesy of a cold front which has moved in. It's brought some rain to the northwest earlier on, but it's weakening all the while. And really, as we head into the evening, just a few spots of rain affecting parts of Wales and the Midlands, and then most places dry overnight. One or two showers into the north of Scotland, a brisk breeze here, the cloud further south tending to break up, so some clear spells by dawn. But it's a warm night in the south, 17 to 19 Celsius, cooler further north, 11 to 13 degrees for Scotland, Northern Ireland and Northern England. Into the start of Wednesday then, warm across much of England and Wales from the word go, plenty of sunshine, any cloud in the far south tending to break and disappear. And then blue skies for much of the day for England and Wales, a bit more cloud for Northern Ireland and Scotland, a few showers for central Scotland, Northern Scotland as well. 18 Celsius for Glasgow, 20 for Belfast, but up into the mid to high 20s once again for South Wales and Southern England. And that sunshine again will feel hot. So we keep the heat in the south, even if it does turn cooler for a few days further north. But for the vast majority, it is staying dry. And into Wednesday night, it's another relatively warm night with temperatures in the south only dipping to 15 to 17 Celsius, 11 to 13 for Scotland, Northern Ireland and Northern England. A few showers around for Northern Ireland and Northern and Western Scotland first thing Thursday. Bright skies otherwise and plenty of sunshine for the southern half of the UK once again. And by this stage, well, things are starting to turn warmer. And by the weekend, widespread sunny skies return and we're back up into the 30s.